Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Behruz Ramadi Tabrizi. I'm the director of um, Sharmin and Bijan Musawar Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies. And uh, I would like to welcome all of you to uh, Anthropologies of Knowledge in Iran. Um, uh, we've been working to make this event happen for a long time. and. Uh, and it's such a pleasure that finally it worked out and, uh, and in a beautiful April day. And uh, of course, I hear from uh, our friend and colleague in Montreal that it's snowing there, but, uh, <laughs> but we are having a nice uh, April day in Princeton. Um, before I start, I would like, uh, as always, to thank uh, uh, my colleague, Becky Parnian, uh, for her hard work uh, to uh, make sure that these events happen smoothly uh, with the help of our uh, IT person, Pete Novak. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, your uh, hard work uh, for all these uh, series. Uh, um, before I uh, introduce uh, our guests today, let me go over some of the logistics. Uh, uh, each of our guests would uh, speak for uh, 10 to 15 minutes um, uh, as a sort of opening remark, uh, uh, talking about the topic. Yeah. And then uh, we'll have a short conversation after that. And then I'll open the uh, floor for your questions. Uh, uh, you can submit your questions uh, through the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, I would uh, bundle the questions or read the questions directly and pose them to our uh, guests. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, again, as I said, this was an event that we've been uh, waiting for a long time uh, to, to happen uh, with uh, Sitrak uh, Manukian, uh, who's an associate professor of anthropology and the Institute for Islamic Studies uh, uh, at McGill University. Um, he earned his PhD from University of Michigan. Uh, Professor Manukian is the author of The City of Knowledge in 20th Century Iran, Shiraz, History, Poetry, which uh, came out uh, in uh, 2012. It's a beautiful book, nicely crafted book that uh, presents a cultural history of modern Iran from the point of view of Shiraz, uh, a city famous for its poetry and its traditions of scholarship, exploring the relationships among history, poetry, uh, and politics. The book an uh, analyzes how Shiraz came to be defined as the country's cultural capital and explains how Iranians have used the concept of culture as the way of thinking about themselves their past and their relationship with the rest of the world. A major theme that weaves Professor Manukian's work together is the analysis of knowledge, its production and its relationship to power. He has written widely uh, on a variety of topics, including temporality, audio vision, publicness, and the notion of the impersonal. Is also a published an Italian translation uh, and commentary on the Ghazals of Saadi Shirazi. And uh, I would ask him to pronounce the Italian translation after I'm done with the introduction, because I wouldn't dare to read the Italian title of the book. Um, our other guest uh, is our own um, Milad. Oda Ba'i, uh, who's a postdoctoral research associate in the Sharmin and Bijan Musawar Rahmani Center at uh, Princeton University. His research interests include history and historiography of Iran, religion, politics, violence, and subjectivity, as well as the transition and uh, translation and uh, migration. His writings have appeared in comparative studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Comparative Islamic Studies, How, Journal of uh, Ethnographic Theory, and the edited volume on Iran's Constitutional Revolution of 1906, and Narratives of in the Enlightenment. He is currently working on his first book manuscript, uh, 
um, titled The Outside, Translation and Iranian Travails of Learned Politics, which uh, offers a historical and anthropological reflection on the translation of European social thought in contemporary Iran. So uh, without further ado, uh, uh, the floor, the screen is yours, uh, Sitrak. And would you please tell us the ti Italian title of your translation of Saadi before you start? You're on mute, I think. Uh, I'm not anymore, I think. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, um, l'argento di un povero cuore. But in Persian is sime delle meskin, uh -huh. which is actually a, a mesro from, uh, from one of Sadi's casa, sime delle meskin. Uh, thank you, thank you for such a warm introduction and uh, thank you to the Mustavar uh, Rahmani Center and to Professor uh, Kamarita Brizi uh, for in having me. It's really a pleasure and a honor to be here um, and uh, also to, to meet uh, through the screen so uh, the other participants. I really look forward to, the, to this informal conversation. Um, my task, I'm going to share my screen um, uh, so that uh, maybe instead of, of looking at me, you'll see a little bit some, some words that will guide my conversation. Uh, my, my, the few words I'm going to say will introduce the topic uh, of today's conversation. And I would also uh, like uh, through that to discuss a little bit my my, my own current work on, uh, on poetry, while uh, thinking more broadly about the question of the relationship between anthropology, knowledge, uh, and Iran. So I think one can say that uh, any anthropological research in some way is a, is a research on knowledge. Uh, but um, for the... <laughs> For today's uh, task, I think more concretely, I want to um, uh, try to provide a, um, a general framework through which we can uh, think of um, uh, contemporary anthropological research on Iran and the way this research approaches uh, knowledge. Um, of course, there are many different approaches and debates and uh, also differences uh, among contemporary anthropologists. But um, I think maybe it is possible, at least in a general sense, to, um, to identify a few, uh, a few elements that all these uh, um, uh, work uh, shares. Um, Anthropologists nowadays, when they approach knowledge, is they're merely concerned uh, uh, knowledge about Iran. Of course, they're mainly concerned with studying the categories through which knowledge is produced and uh, classified, and therefore to study the meaning of these uh, categories. Uh, what does law mean? What does religion mean? What does culture mean? What does theology mean? What does Ravon Shenossi means? What does Dep, the Press Shodan means? And here Persian matters because maybe these meanings are not the same as their English uh, translations. What does science mean? What does El mean? What does Agl mean? What does Qayb mean? As in the marvelous book by Ali Rezatus Dor. What does Edolat mean? Gozasht in um, um, Orezuo San Luz book. Uh, but also what Zan, Mard, or other genders, or Bitaklif Budan mean in contemporary Iran, as uh, Afsone Najmobadi uh, has discussed in her, in her professing selves. And here, of course, I could go on with other examples. I don't want to you know, forget people I'm not, uh, I'm not mentioning. Um, how, how are these uh, categories and their meaning studied? I think there are three axes uh, of analysis that anthropologists nowadays usually, let's say, use to study categories and their meanings. They look at history. That is, they look at the ways in which certain meanings and, and categories have changed, have transformed through time. 
um, in, in when they, they applying the, the when they think through this historical approach, um, they're very, very interested in thinking about the late Qajar period and also the 1979 revolution as time points that offer certain comparative uh, perspective to analyze these transformations through time. At the same time, these categories, um, uh, like I said, you know, Ravon Shenossi, Deb Shodan, or Reib, or so on, are seen through the angle, through the perspective often of, uh, of the nation. Of course, the nation is in itself a category that has changed a lot through time, uh, but the nation is itself uh, a relational, let's say, element to think about the history of categories. Uh, second axis, uh, geography. So the transformation of, um, of, uh, of categories through place, how these categories and their meaning changes in different places or traveling from one place uh, to another. And here, of course, Europe or, Amer or Europe and America or the West uh, also Harb, uh, become very important elements in considering the geographies, uh, these geographies uh, of knowledge. A lot of the anthropological analysis on categories and their meaning is done by thinking through and with the travel back and forth from Iran uh, and Europe. And, and in relation to this, um, you know, uh, uh, we, uh, I'm, I'm speaking, of course, very generally and generically, maybe about very complex questions, but again, it's, it's an informal conversation. The question of modernity in relation to geography occupies uh, an important space, which also means, um, to cut a very long story short, that history and geography themselves for anthropologists are, are not empty categories, but are themselves involved in historical and geographical transformations, right? So the history and geography themselves are not empty category, but are themselves part of what anthropologists uh, study uh, today in relation to Iran. Last but not least, the, the third axis of analysis, we could call it uh, the axis of encounters. Anthropologists um, uh, study knowledge by encounters with people, conversations, uh, they work with interlocutors who become themselves involved in the research, and they, uh, you know, they contribute significantly to what uh, what anthropologists are uh, elaborating. And therefore, questions of uh, how selves oneself relates to to the world and to others, questions of self, we can say, or subjectivity, using a more philosophical term become very important in, in anthropologies of knowledge. Again, just to quote an example among, among many, uh, the, the title of Sonei Najmol, that is book professing selves, but also the, the recent, well, it's not this, in terms of discipline, it's not an anthropology book, but it, it deploys a lot of anthropological categories, Persian itself by, um, by Vinokio. So, um, these encounters often become questions of, of subjectivity and, and discussions about the self. Um, uh, and I look forward in some way, you know, to discuss with uh, Dr. Odobei how his own research about translation is infused and, and operates at the threshold of all these axes of analysis, which I think is, is reconfiguring and rethinking in, in, very, in very interesting ways. I myself, in my, in my research, in my past research on, on poetry and knowledge, which Professor Marita Brizzi had the kindness of, um, of presenting in, in such eloquent ways, I tried in some way, or I recognize now retrospectively that I used some of, of this uh, framework, if not paradigm, that I, that I just discussed. Um, I won't go into, into this now. If you want, you can ask me. But, there was a moment in which this approach to poetry as knowledge, I became less convinced about it. There was something that was left out. And what, in my view, uh, was left out was something we could call the power of poetry itself. The power, the power of poetry to move people, 
how to approach this uh, anthropologically. So I started, you know, as any anthropologist would do, uh, to go back to Shiraz and go back to the Anjuman, to the poetic assemblies where poetry is, uh, is discussed and recited, where poetry is a matter of life and, and, and matters a lot. People take poetry very seriously. Of course, in Iran, everybody takes poetry very seriously. Professor Gana Marita Brizi has a nice uh, series of photographs behind him that the show the relevance of poetry in any knowledge gathering such as, such as ours. Um, but I, I began thinking that instead of approaching poetry as a kind of knowledge, maybe it, was, it would be interesting to think of knowledge as a kind of poetry, to turn, to turn the questions upside down. So use that, um, uh, that framework was, uh, and that approach that I, that I briefly sketched before, but, but, but transformed. And, and here briefly, I, I, and I conclude with this, I just want to indicate some of the lines of research that I'm currently working on. So history, this trajectory of history and the Anjuman uh, and, and its relationship to poetry was less a question of heritage, of national heritage or humanistic heritage or civilizational heritage that poetry and, and Iran sort of compose was more a way of thinking uh, into relational forms. Poetry itself is a relational form, is an association of words and sounds via prosody, by meter, but it's also an association of, of unusual combination of words uh, with Kasre and Zofé, and we, of course, these are very complex topics that I, I won't get into. But, history at the Anjuman becomes a way of relating past and present and not past as something that is, um, that is stable, but something that continues to come back and is repeated, reenacted or acted as a new, um, in, a very, in a very relational way, repetition and difference, one might say. And geography. Now, of course, um, the origin and the transformations of poetry and where is poetry coming from and who, who does poetry belong to are very important uh, in the Anjuman setting. But I think that what emerges in these conversations, of course, I would have to tell you in a way that I cannot do now, um, how, and, and in the reciting of poetry, is a certain sense of poetry as extraterritorial, as going beyond the usual territory that are defined by both sort of physical, political, or even let's say imaginative uh, geography. So here's where I think I came to the realization back again that the poetry is really about desire of the other in the sense of desiring what the other desires and, and how poetry triggers that. And if you have read um, Persian poetry you to this audience, which of, of course is much more learned knows much more poet poetry that, that I do <laughs> is, is no secret. All this to say, and, and here um, I want to conclude, that this combination of form and desire of history and geography reinterpreted in the way I did. Um, at the Anjuman, of course, becomes an encounter and, and people at the Anjuman talk a lot about themselves and others. It is a question of recognition. Uh, I, I am a better poet than you are, <laughs> or, you know, I deserve more space in the Anjuman than you do. And there's a lot of, you know, competition also and, um, and, 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 and mutual recognition or misrecognition. However, at the same time, the combination of, uh, of desire and form at the, at the Anjuman generates something else as a transformative power uh, in my view, that takes away, um, takes away uh, uh, um, you know, a stable structure idea of the self and really reopens it up to something else. Um, and, and this something else I call, uh, I call impersonal. Um, undoing of history, undoing on geography, undoing of self lead to this idea of um, poetry as, as potential, poetry as possibility, poetry as is existential force. And um, I think I've talked 
already too much for now. And I look forward to, to hearing me a lot uh, of the way and the conversation that will follow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Satrak. This was so wonderful. And I already have so many questions and uh, we're already getting so many questions uh, from our uh, members of the audience. Uh, so uh, the floor is yours for now, uh, Milad, and uh, welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Ramari Tabrizi. Um, it's an honor for me to be in conversation with you and Professor Manukian. Um, thanks also Becky Pernian and everybody who made this meeting possible. Uh, in the interest of time, I will uh, jump into my presentation and I look forward to the conversation. Uh, in my presentation today and in my work, I think in general, I try to think about how translation and the kind of knowledge that translation produce, produces in Iran is caught up in various referential economies, um, including economies of Iran and the West, maybe historical and geographic economies as drawing on Professor Manukian's um, sort of general guidelines. Uh, but to what extent it also pushes beyond those referential economies, it relates to potentialities of language and discourse, maybe to uh, it relates to what Professor Mnuchin theorizes as, as the impersonal. Uh, but I'm also thinking through these uh, questions, so I look forward to your uh, comments. I will also share my screen. There we go, I think you have it. In the recent years, scholars and observers of Iranian society have began, begun to notice the proliferations of text concepts and theories that we associate with continental philosophy and social theory in various spaces of debate in Iran. Practices of reading and translation and exegesis of social thought, as well as debates about them, have emerged at the center of intellectual and scholarly practices of a diverse group of thinkers that include statespersons, Shia seminarians, academics, and activists. The figure of the translator, Mutar Jem, is a socially valorized figure. It is celebrated by some as an intellectual vanguard who contributes to civil discourse and is seen by others with suspicion. Translation is debated in relationship to Western cultural imperialism and a condition of intellectual disablement that makes Iran a consumer in the global market of theory. While some translators have a scholarly training, Many do not. This very fact points to the limitation and significance of translation as a practice of knowledge. Translators are central in producing the discursive basis of a conversation about the state's political economy, language, culture, religion, ethics, technology, and other important topics. Yet their interventions are largely episodic and not centered in a scholarly community or an institutional framework that can enable the dialogical development of knowledge. The French scholar of translation, Antoine Berman, suggests that the history of translation cannot be separated from the larger transformations of language, religions, and nations. Anthropologists and historians of translation echo the epochal significance of translation when they invite us to consider the cross-linguistic and cross-cultural movements in, relations to in relation to to translations and transformations internal to a language, a set of cultural practices and social and political worlds. The anthropological concept of translation that I am working with also includes representations of sound, sounds, gestures, historical silences, embodied experiences and forms of knowledge in words and vice versa. The contemporary Iranian translations are part of the historical experience of tajaddud, modernity, the emergence of a unique figure of knowledge known as the Roshan Fikr, enlightened thinker, and the rise of novel genres of writing such as the European travelogue, the novel and social criticism. For example, the Qajar travel writings of Mirza Saleh Shirazi from the early 19th century is the site of translation of unprecedented conceptions of law, liberty, and equality 
قانون آزادی and برابری that came to be central to Iran's modern political culture or to the time space that we call modern Iran. An archaeological study can reveal the epistemic significance of translation that historically and theoretically predate Iranian ideologies of reform and revolution, including those of Iranian nationalism and Islamic revolution. But the anti-Western discourses of Islamic revolution have been central in shaping the present institutional arrangements and motivations of ongoing practices of translation. Following the establishment of the Islamic Republic in 1979, in what is known as Engalab Farhangi, the Cultural Revolution, the Iranian Academy was closed down for a period of two years with the aim of purging it from discourses and scholars who were deemed as a threat to the revolutionary agenda of the Islamic State. The universities were reopened and continued to operate under the oversight of the Supreme Council of the Cultural Revolution that seeks to produce through Bumi Sazi and Islami Sazi, indigenization and Islamicization, what is described as Islamic human sciences and Islamic social sciences. Part of this agenda has been the mobilization of Shia seminaries, their discourses, as well as the structures of funding and oversight. Today, for example, the Imam Khomeini Research Institute developed under the leadership of the late cleric Misbah Yazdi in Qom, pictured here in the bottom left and top right, offers doctorate degrees in political science, sociology, and history, among other fields of human sciences. During the research that is the basis of my current book project, I try to understand this and other revolutionary and post-revolutionary investments in translation by attending graduate seminars in Tehran and Qom, speaking with clerics and scholars in research centers of Shia seminaries, and participating in public venues and private translation circles. One of these public venues is the Porsesh Institute, which has been central to proliferations of social and critical theory in the last decade. Porsesh gained popularity around the weekly seminars of key figures, such as Javad Tabo Tabai, Murad Farhadpur, and Mustafa Malikian, on the history of political and social thought, critical theory, and ethics, respectively. Tabo Tabai on the screen on the top, uh, on the bottom left, is a political a philosopher trained in Shia seminaries and at the Sorbonne, who was perched from his position at the head of political philosophy at Tehran University in the 1990s. Farad Pur, pictured in the seminar in the top right on the right, is the leading translator of critical theory, who is also a critic and a poet. Malik Yan, an ethicist, comes from the Shia seminaries, but is banned from teaching in the seminaries and universities because he's, he openly speaks about the epistemological limitations of seminary education for living an ethical life. Popular courses at Porsesh draw up to 100 students, ranging from graduate students and young seminarians to working professionals and states bureaucrats. Some are Marxist partisans of the 1979 revolution who find themselves blindsided by the rise of Islamic politics and attend seminars on Hegel and Marx to rethink their political past and future. Others are activists who got to create a modern Islamic state, but are now translating Christian and secular discourses of hermeneutics and political theology to rethink the relationship between the teachings of Sharia and the demands of modern politics. Still others are the children of the revolutionary generations who passionately read Charles Taylor and Jürgen Habermas on secularism and civil society as to think about politics outside the revolutionary dreams of their earlier generations and beyond what they perceived as limitations of inherited discourses of knowledge. Newspapers and journals cover the debates and events at, held at Porsesh. These debates and their textual references then are taken up by scholars and students in the universities and the seminaries who operate within the spaces overseen by the Supreme Council of Cultural Revolution. Um, 
An example is the translation of the writings of the German jurist Karl Schmidt and the emergence of the discourse of Elahiyata Siyasi, political theology, as a way to make sense of Islamic state and particularly the Shia doctrine of Belayat al-Faqih. In 2014, I participated in two seminars at Porsej that centrally elaborated on Schmidt and debates about him. At the same time, I was a participant in a graduate course in one of Tehran's top universities, where academics and seminarians drew on Schmidt in English and in Persian tr translation, and about Persian debates on political theology, next to the Islamic interpretive sciences and the archives of Hadith and the Quran, to debate the politics of the Islamic state, and also various other topics, including Iran's geopolitical ventures in Iraq, for example. In line with the mandates of the Cultural Revolution, these debates produced an Islamic variety of Christian turned secular theoretical discourse of political theology and expanded the frontiers of quote unquote Islamic knowledge. At the same time, it enabled a conversation about the limitations of Islamic discourses of law, philosophy, and theology in making sense of the unprecedented nature of, the Iran of Iranian and global politics. The institutional spaces and the discursive practices of translation are shaped by and embody ideologies, dreams, as well as violent exclusions of revolutionary and post-revolutionary politics but importantly, they also exceed them, bringing forth the epistemological space that is the condition of possibility of various ideologies of revolution and the state. Let me conclude by suggesting that in the, this epistemological space, the translation of social theory is part of an attempt to come to terms with the limitations of communicative capacities to put into language and to debate the historical experience of Iran's revolutionary century. In this operation, the practice of translation has a reparative quality. It extends beyond communication of meaning across different contexts and medium, mediums to expand the very possibility of meaning or what Walter Benjamin described in the Kantian language of communicability or translatability. The significance of translation relates to the potentiality of Persian language as a medium to languages poetic and speculative capacities for the development of theory and philosophy, and not simply its reified discursive arrangements. The kind of knowledge that translation produces is not defined in its separation from various ideologies and pathologies of Iranian tajaddud, modernity. Rather, like the knowledge that is produced in the space of a psychoanalytic clinic, it includes them. It is a kind of knowledge that can be described by borrowing the Freudian language of rep remembering, repeating, and working through earlier ideologies and attachments toward a more analytic or lettered political discourse. Thank you. That was so great. <laughs> The, yeah, you know, sometimes uh, I tell my own students that uh, uh, whenever I walk in front of Tehran University and like that, like six blocks of bookstores and I, <laughs> and I see all these books, you know, uh, and, uh, and I think to myself that if there is a heaven, this should be it, you know, I want to go to that heaven, you know, I can all day walk in front of bookstores and, and see all these amazing books of translation, poetry, and, and, uh, and uh, this really puts that in, in such a uh, um, uh, thought-provoking context. And, and I wanted to um, uh, raise a rather general question because I, I noticed, uh, Sitrag, in your uh, um, classification of history and, and geography and encounter, you put history up to the point of the revolution. And um, from Qajar to the revolution of 79. And, uh, and, uh, and then, you know, in, in Mila's uh, uh, presentation, uh, I thought maybe do we, can we say that a shift is happening there in terms of production of knowledge 
and uh, a distinct and deeper search for understanding the world and bringing in through dealing with the Islamic past, European philosophy, and that level of engagement, which is truly uh, unprecedented as far as I know in Iranian history and that kind of intense participation. And, and so do you see there is there a reason that you put that date there until uh, the uh, 79 revolution? And do you think that there is this a shift is happening in terms of the role and of poetry in production and communication of knowledge and that sort of new movement of translation and new engagement with the Islamic past is kind of uh, taking over that space uh, in, in different ways. Milad, or shall I? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you. No, first of all, congratulations to Milad Dabey for a very eloquent presentation. Um, I guess that when, when I put those timelines, it, it's uh, so anthropologists in general, again, I'm speaking generically here, maybe simplifying too much, but they operate uh, in, in the present. They think, they think knowledge in relation to the present. So, and, and, and for anthropologists, difference is also, uh, uh, as you were pointing out, is, is very relevant. So when they think historically, they, they, they try to trace differences and their comparison points, if we want to exaggerate a little bit, um, are you, some often uh, the late Qajar period is a moment of transformation and uh, the Islamic uh, revolution and, and uh, Islamic Republic in 1979 and the post-revolutionary period as moments where things substantially changed. And that, that's what I meant where the historical approach usually involves discussions of, uh, you know, um, uh, the constitutional revolution as a significant a transformation of the relationship with uh, Western Moors and, and, and po political and social forms, and then uh, the revolution of 79. It's very difficult to, um, <laughs> so to speak, measure the intensity of the passion for knowledge <laughs> and the engagement uh, in poetry. Um, I think I, I hear many people today in Iran uh, complain or mourn the fact that poetry is not as relevant as it used to be, that other literary forms, theater, the short story are much more dynamic, have taken much more ground, and more interesting. Um, so I, I don't want to dare to you know, decide whether poetry is, is, is more or less relevant today. But um, in my view, um, you know, in poetry, some of these fundamental questions about knowledge, we can put it there, uh, seems to resurface over and over again. But maybe we should also yeah. hear what Milad wants to contribute mm -hmm. to this discussion. Yeah, I, I think um, that's a, when I think about post-revolutionary Iran, it's not just also a historical periodization, it's also a distinct problematic mm -hmm. that then is engaged in various discourses, right? So mm -hmm. as, for example, Behruz, your own work has shown, so the revolution had many ideologies and many attachments, but it also was an event that recruited subjects and was impersonal in this sense. Mm -hmm. So so it, so it uh, produced um, and it surprised those who were even uh, understood themselves as subjects of the revolution. And I think this element of surprise and shock has uh, led to problematization of Iranian history. What is Iran and how do we understand it? And in the spaces of knowledge in the post-revolutionary period, we can understand uh, the cultural revolution itself and turn to uh, both history of uh, Iranian thought, Islamic thought, as well as translations of European thought as part of the questions that revolution produced, part of the shock of, of, of um, the aftermath of the revolution um, 
it's so the kind of knowledge that is produced, it's the knowledge that inhabits this history, this, tra this tra trauma, let's say the interruption of Iranian, um, or, of Iranian history. Um, I think anthropologies of Iran, we could say, reflect this when they thematize question of knowledge in thinking about post-revolutionary society. So from, from Roy Motayadeh's Mantle of Prophet to Michael Fisher's work to Setrag's um, own um, problematization of knowledge as an important site to think about Iran, um, reflect that. Um, I'll stop there. Yeah, no, that's, that's really true. And, and, I, and I think in, in, a, in a sense, it sort of connects me to uh, the other issue that uh, Satrak, I, I uh, listened to your um, presentation on the poetic sociology, and and I thought that you know this is uh, sort of interesting that one of the issues that perhaps also links what Milad is talking about in translation and you are talking about in poetry is the question of ambiguity and how where is the place of this ambiguity in the way uh, uh, the uh, production of knowledge happens in Iran. And, uh, and of course, one can again argue that, is there a distinction in the Iranian production of knowledge with ambiguity or, but, but nevertheless, at so many different levels, the, that, that kind of the operation of that ambiguity always is present, but whatever you know, we, we read of, of course, Poetry itself is sort of opens up that 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 space uh, in terms of knowing the world and uh, and then uh, and then in translation also you know we we enter this space of um, uh, of unknowing and then reknowing and reconstituting a text into a new space that that I I thought that you know and. And surprisingly to me that you don't highlight the notion of ambiguity. Uh, I wonder if, if you can talk a little bit about that or both of you, you know, uh, what is the place of ambiguity in, in this uh, conversation about knowledge? Because obviously that goes to the core of understanding of knowledge. And um, so if you can comment on that, that, I would really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Behruz. You're opening a you're opening a notion here. <laughs> um, a kind of warm there. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, not necessarily. I mean, yes, uh, <laughs> obviously, Iham Iham is central. I mean, if we can want to, you, you know, pick a particular rhetorical figure that kind of can can uh, can summarize this question of of um, ambiguity. Is home is central, or we could say each. Um, each meaning has its shadow and its mm. uh, kind of rever reverberations, right? And, and, and through difference. Um, um, this, um, I don't, yeah, I mean, um, I, I think I implied when I mean, um, when I'm talking about sort of um, poetry as being a modality of relation. And I think Milad also, uh, maybe he will talk about this more, but when he talks about translation as potentiality, I think that we we there, there is a, an idea of, of let's say ambiguity as openness as a po something positive rather than just um, uh, a shadow in the negative sense. Right. Um, I think this is a difficult terrain because, uh, as you know, uh, much better than me, uh, this is the accusation that for centuries <laughs> Europeans have have pointed against, <laughs> in particular Persian poetry. And, um, and maybe, you know, Iranians more generally is this question of dissimulation or, you know, never always, always leaving things um, sort of not clear defined, therefore to then um, sort of, you know, operate again <laughs> in the shadow. So uh, I think one has to also, um, you know, as anthropologists usually do, look critically at this kind of genealogy. But um, no, I think, and, and uh, um, I, I am, yeah. Ambiguity is um, is an is a is a latent um, dimension of speech. I would I would say uh, so. You know that that's certainly central, not only not only in poetry. Uh, 
Um, Milan. Um, I don't know if I have any anything insightful to contribute, but maybe I can say two things. One about um, so. Um, uh, there is the ambiguity of historical reference, reference like Iran, like the West, and like Islam, or uh, even um, and, and these when I mean, they're taken up as um, objects of knowledge and debate, but then when they're inhabit when they're in encountered and inhabited in the space of translation, certain reified notions are put at rest, and certain conceptions of difference are. Are, are relaxed and other new modalities of, uh, of thinking and being emerges within these spaces of translation. On the other hand, I think there is also the, I wonder whether we can think about the ambiguity between conceptual versus metaphorical use of language. So when I'm thinking about translation of European concepts or theories, I am not necessarily sure once this act of translation into Persian language happens, we are dealing with simply terms or words or with concepts that have a certain degree of generalizability. I think, I think that in general, social theory in Iran has this ambiguity. Um, and, and so that this is why I often, uh, the question of potentiality is important because maybe we are inhabiting the space of uh, moving from metaphors to concepts or vice versa, mm -hmm. or the conceptual capacities of metaphors. But, 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 but I'm, I'm not sure whether we can uh, decisively uh, think of something as a concept or theory yet. Yeah. Um, no, what you say make, makes perfect sense to me. You know, that's, uh, that's quite uh, convincing, I think. Um, yeah, there's a question about... Uh, for, this is mostly for uh, Setra, for you, that uh, uh, perhaps uh, a difficult question that uh, uh, how did poetry manage to become such a overarching kind of mode of expression in, in Iran, sociologically, philosophically, and, uh, and then whether or not that kind of significance is uh, overshadowed or is being um, uh, affected by these new modes of social media and with the blurbs, with messages, and and does that change anything in that sort of significance of poetry in Iranian culture? Um, yes, another <laughs> another long long question that I have to answer very briefly. Um, to start from uh, the end, um, as far as I can. Tell. I haven't done enough research of this, but as far as I can tell, uh, poetry is, is alive and well on social media, uh, where um, there's an encounter between uh, old forms of um, poetic production and circulation and new ones that are being reconfigured by, by social media themselves. So Anjoman mm -hmm. now meet on, uh, on Telegram and uh, and elsewhere in, in, in verses are circulated mm -hmm. more than ever before by SNM, SMS and, and um, text, uh, I mean, in, in, in English and, and, um, and, and other means through social media. This actually in some way maybe is also a global phenomenon because, uh, because you know, there, there's also a, a new, form or generations of poets that uh, produces via social media. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and there are poetic phenomena of, of young poets, maybe in English also, no, in English also, that sell millions of copies uh, via um, uh, poems that I've first composed and shared through Instagram or, or Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, so the relevance of poetry, um, why poetry matters in Iran? Uh, this is, of course, the fundamental question, and I have to a little bit backtrack to, you know, the kind of framework that, that I was proposing. There, are, there is a genealogical answer to this question. I mean, uh, uh, poetic production in Iran was always very important um, through the centuries, and maybe one should do a historical analysis of that. But as, as for the modern period, it is as if poetry uh, sort of captured as... Um, um, 
also Milad was beautifully saying before, a certain form of, of subjectivity at, at particular moments with this were, was really, really important, where the poetic tradition was retooled for a, for a modern uh, form of subject formation uh, by looking at the past and reinterpreting it perhaps in national terms or in humanistic terms as when uh, today people, you know, recognizing Sadi, uh, a universal humanist, mm -hmm. um, uh, but also in conjunction with, uh, you know, the production of Orientalist knowledge and the relevance that Persian poetry had for uh, European culture, which was then mirrored back uh, in some way into Iran. I think these are uh, all relevant phenomena. And then, um, you know, whether this is itself an intellectual construction or not, going back also to your point about ambiguity, there is an entire discourse uh, in Iran about poetry being capable of expressing what other forms of knowledge cannot express, either uh, because of censorship or because of other limited forms. So poetry becomes, mm -hmm. uh, becomes the place where history is really expressed. The, the real history of Iran can find its locus. The soul of Persians, uh, Persians <laughs> can, can find its, its location. Or even in theological terms, sometimes the, the poetry is can, what can really express the theology, right? And where, where you can have a, a relationship with theology. All these, of course, have to be explored uh, ethnographically. And that's why <laughs> I'm going back to the Anjuman uh, to me, understand the existence. Me. No, that's, that's, that's so good. Uh, May I just uh, sure, I know sure, me, yeah. for me, but it's too rich to pass um, oh. about the significance of poetry. Um, Farooq Farooqzad on, on your wall has a line in one of her famous poems about the different. I'm just pointing to Farooq Farooqzad. Yes, I see, I see. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, between seeing, between the window and seeing, there is a distance. Uh, in Ibn Khaldun and Social Sciences, a text, a, a text that is important for me in Persian by Javad Tabo Taboi, he, used, he draws on this line by Furu to think, to think about what would it mean to simply describe social events and what would it mean to systematize in a discourse of knowledge, <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, social events, history? So he raises uh, what Farouk expresses in mm -hmm. the form of Shere No, itself a transformation within the history of Persian poetry, a historical transformation, to think about a possibility of a new form, transmission of a new form of knowledge, social theory, social sciences in Persian. Um, so perhaps one of the significances of Persian poetry, uh, not thought about as a timeless um, uh, tradition, but as a tradition with its own sort of historical development, breaks, transformations that could think about and express something historical, something about, let's say, the nature of modernity of the modern subject, modern gender subject, in the case of Farouk, to think about transmission and development of knowledge. So maybe that's one of the significances mm. of conceptual significances of yeah. Persian poetry. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. I have to say, I can't pass that, this one either. I, I, it reminds me of, you know, I have second year graduate school. I was writing a paper on the on the conversations in the Iranian majlis about the budget. And, uh, and uh, so I'm reading the minutes one after another, these members of the parliament, they're reciting poetry and to, to justify their critique of the budget, you know, and, and then I'm painstakingly translating these poems for my professor, you know, <laughs> and then I give the paper and, and my professor says, what the hell is this? I said, this is a debate in Majlis about the, the, the budget, you know, all expressed in the, in the language of poetry. You know, that's a, it's totally incomprehensible. You know, you can't even translate that. Anyhow, but um, let me uh, see. Uh, the, there's a very important question um, on the question of the existential. 
Um, and uh, and uh, both of you, uh, the question asks uh, that you try to look at the power behind poetry and behind the discourse and how it operates uh, uh, beyond the uh, surface in words and semantics and, and, uh, and through incorporating sort of structures of power and, 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 uh, and, uh, and how you can sort of have access, how to have access to this existential through your own ethnographic work. Um, uh, I don't know if it makes sense to you or not. Yeah, okay. Milot, shall, shall I? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, very briefly. Well, it's, it's, uh, it, it's tough, of course, because, um, um, you know, anth anthropology is at the borderline between the visible and the invisible, but, um, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, the old and very critique tools of observation and participation matter here in some way, also to think uh, existentially. Uh, and as I think maybe the questioner was implying, not only in terms of what people say, but what people express or what, what certain, uh, in the Anjuman, for example, atmosphere is very important, something that is uh, almost impalpable and it's not possible uh, perhaps to describe in analytical terms, but, but with, with metaphors uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, a certain existential atmosphere, that a certain air that is, uh, you know, that circulates in the room when people uh, read and, uh, and listen to, mm -hmm. uh, to poems. There's also, of course, and I've discussed this along with poets, how poets, for example, talk about the relationship between, this is more discursive, but I think it's important, the relationship between their lives and their poetry. And there, there are glimpses of this kind of uh, existential relationship that they entertain with their own verses, which is not by any means a simple one, right? We talk about inspiration, and, uh, and production and being affected by certain situations and so on. And then uh, the poetry itself uh, can be read, uh, not just uh, semantically in terms of it, but the relational form that it, it institutes, I think are, are quite interesting in that regard. Uh, translation, I think it's uh, equally. I don't necessarily have much to add about it. Maybe mm. just in a more sort of a sim basic sense, I am also the, the kinds of passions and the, the personal stories and personal narratives immediately opens to something that it cannot be digested or reduced to a discourse of subjectivity or personhood, mm. and, and then it's animated uh, the, the the very practices that appear as deeply conceptual and intellectual, but precisely what I, I, I have learned through basically field work is to think about those, what appears as highly conceptual or intellectual practices in relationship to those existential forces that move subjects almost beyond themselves uh, unconsciously, compels them, produces compulsions and certain sensibilities. And, 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 and think about uh, also, let's say, histories of scholarships, of religion, of Islam itself in producing those conceptions, compulsions beyond, uh, beyond certain secularist reduc reduction. So for example, it is quite um, part of the let's say existential force of translation is related to a scholastic tradition of the seminaries as it is politicized and mobilized in new spaces, sometimes even against what is officially religion. Um, yeah. That's good, that's good. So one more question, uh, because I'm also very curious about this question uh, that uh, often in translations, this is for Milad, uh, uh, the uh, the translation of the terms are done without any application to Iranian context, um, like Foucauldian terms of uh, like heterotopia or panopticon, panopticon. They're translated, but with no tangible examples inside Iran. Uh, is this true, or uh, is 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 there because of censorship or self censorship? Uh, 
uh, how much the translations are contextualized in order to make the translation relevant to the Iranian condition? I think I think that's a sort of an open question. If I understand mm -hmm. the question correctly, I think it. Um, when texts are translated, they're translated without necessarily exemplifications or mm -hmm. are produced. And but when they are debated and read in public, mm -hmm. uh, it's quite interesting actually to think about how. Um, I remember distinctly a class in Porsesh because you bring up Panopticon and question of sovereignty, where where disciplinary Foucauldian disciplinary power, Agamben's sovereign power, biopower was being sort of discussed and they were there were debates and conversations and the translator trying to think about which model is is more apt in thinking about let's say the Islamic Republic. Uh, so I think these are open questions, but even the application of theories in two cases from Iran to Iranian history to Iranian politics itself is problematized. So, so this very model of looking for examples is itself debated as, as an adequate model of thinking about translation or not. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This was uh, so rich and and uh, and wonderful. And uh, I'm with apologies to all the uh, members of the audience who raised questions and we didn't have time to get to them. That means that we are going to invite you back here, Sutrak. Uh, hopefully, Milad would be here next year and uh, have a have this conversation in person, which would be much more fruitful and and more fun. You know and. Uh, so uh, again, thank you so much for accepting our invitation, both of you, Milad and Setrak, and then all of you who attended this meeting. And uh, I'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.